Coming up on DTNS, online cow sharing. I didn't say car wrong, cow. The coming AI knitting revolution and why Cloudflare doesn't want to have to cut off customers. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 5th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were uh, just talking about Heather Locklear's garlic restaurants uh, on Good Day <laughs> Internet, among with along with my solar installation that I'll be yep. doing. Mm -hmm. You get so much more, folks, when you subscribe to Good Day Internet as a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Amazon updated its assistant smartphone app to now give users the option to remove their recordings from being eligible for analysis from Amazon employees and contractors. Human review of recordings was not previously stated in Amazon's privacy policy. The app now includes the language, quote, with this setting on, your voice recordings may be used to develop new features and manually reviewed to help improve our services. Only an extremely small fraction of voice recordings are manually reviewed. Uh Thank you for doing exactly what I suggested these companies should do. Amazon, well done. Uh, Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi Shuxing announced that it spun off its autonomous driving unit into an independent company. Uh, the unit was created in 2016, has more than 200 employees in California and China, and has the approval to test self-driving vehicles in California. The CEO of the new company is Zhang Bo, the CTO of Didi. He's now the CEO of the new company. Fossil announced its Gen 5 smartwatches, the Carlisle HR and Juliana HR, both 44 millimeter watches with round 1.28 inch OLED displays. They run Wear OS on Qualcomm Snapdragon Wear's 3100 with one gigabyte of RAM and eight gigabytes of storage. There's also a speaker for Google Assistant responses and phone calls. Both models start at $295 and are available now. But it's not the only watch announcement today. In fact, it isn't, Tom. Samsung also an announced the Watch Active 2. It's been six months since Samsung launched the original Watch Active. So, okay, we've got another model. Six months later, the Watch Active 2 adds a touch strip to simulate software controls that require an actual rotating bezel. The Active 2 also adds ECG capability, although it won't be active at launch, but could be activated later on. It runs Samsung's Tizen OS and works with Android and iOS as well. It supports offline play of Spotify playlists and YouTube video playback. The Active 2 will come in 40 and 44 millimeter sizes with LTE versions available as well. And it goes on sale September 27th, starting at two. $279. Yeah. So uh, it, both these stories together uh, illuminate a couple of trends. Uh, one is that Tizen OS doing well as the Samsung smartwatch. And in fact, it's generally uh, a little bit better reviewed than the Wear OS. Wear OS is criticized for being a little slow to add features. So ECG coming to the Watch Active 2 is, is a good example of that. Uh, all these watches seem to be hovering around the $300 price point. Uh, and they all talk about their heart rate monitoring and heart monitoring we didn't we didn't talk about all the features that fossil and samsung announced in that that realm but but it seems like fitness and health are the two things that are driving smartwatch adoption and you're seeing that in both these announcements today yeah i mean listen you're wearing something on your body uh fitness and health is is going to be a big part of it uh, besides obviously telling time and being able to set timers for yourself what's interesting to me is the watch active first gen um you know it got some criticism for 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 not having um for not having that rotating bezel um and for being you know a little lackluster on features the active to solve some of that but the but the original Active has not gone away. This is now just another product in the same marketplace. Yeah, I wonder about that because uh, uh, it, you know, the bezel is in the other Samsung watches that run Tizen, and yeah. the Tizen OS is kind of built around that bezel. So it was a bit awkward trying to do double taps and weird things on the Watch Active. So it's nice that they fixed that by giving you the touch strip, even if they didn't build in a bezel. I get that the Active needs to be a more affordable uh, version of the watch, so you're not going to get that full motion bezel like you would in a more expensive watch but uh why keep the original watch active around inventory is is it they just have a probably yeah yeah i mean if you, you, you yeah you got a million units left um i don't know see see how how much you can drop the price and and get rid of them i suppose uh it's, it's somewhat unusual because the time frame six months is you know it's pretty quick that samsung has has put together the watch that 
probably a lot of people who got the watch active in the first place wanted. It, but it almost feels like they wanted to just do a minor upgrade to the watch active and then realized that they could do a major upgrade to the watch active right? Uh, faster than you might normally think and just decided, you know what, let's do that. We'll just swap it into the supply chain. So, so maybe, maybe the supply chain is still kicking out the original watch actives, which is why you're keeping it around as a less expensive version. You got a couple of SKUs there. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's talk about cows. I African notes that an app called my farm book from livestock wealth which lets users buy shares in cows from a mobile device has grown from 26 cows in 2015 that you could buy a share in to more than 2,000 cows. Livestock Wealth reports generating $3 million in profit. 90% of its investors come from within South Africa, so it's very popular there. Shares cost as little as 576 rand, which works out to around 40 bucks US. Groups of investors can buy a whole cow. So you can get on the app and, and group up and buy a whole cow. Or if you're an individual and you're like, I just want to buy one or two shares, you can buy shares individually in a pregnant cow or young calf, which Roger pointed out uh, in the pre-show is, is kind of like buying futures, beef futures. Livestock mm. Wealth plans to expand into produce as well. They've got a vegetable growing system that they want to make. This isn't new. Chicago Board of Trade and hog futures and, and, and all that sort of stuff has, has existed for a long time. And there's there's equivalents in all, all kinds of countries about buying. But that's been at the at the magnitude that the individual investor would not be able to afford. This democratizes funding of agriculture investment. Uh, and it plays into something that that according to iAfrican and Reuters both. Uh, the idea of owning livestock is kind of has some cachet in, in places like Africa. So, okay. So if I can ask some very obvious questions for anyone who might be like owning a share in a cow, what in the heck you're owning a share in the beef that the cow is going to produce for you eventually. Right. This is not about cow's it, milk. That's how it pays off, right? Right. <laughs> not, right. That would be amazing if they like gave like, <laughs> milk dividends. Uh, right. Yeah. No, this is about beef. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I, so I kind of understand that, but it's interesting because if you think of it as like, okay, I own a share in something that's going to produce money. Well, a share of certain companies is a share. A share is a share is a share. A cow, you know, a cow could get sick. A cow could. Uh, you know, be, be uh, have better meat than another cow. There, there are a lot of variables here, and I wonder if uh, owning something like this again, probably not visiting the farm, many miles away, sometimes a continent away, type of a thing. How much that factors into what kind of a good investment this is? Yeah, no, those are those are all the kind of questions that you want to ask before you jump into my farm book uh, and, and start yeah. dropping around on some cows, right? Uh, because if you're doing an institutional investing, you're investing in hundreds of thousands of cows at a time. So you're more concerned with the practice of the farm than you are with the individual cow. But in, in this situation, if you're buying a single share in a calf, well, man, yeah, if that calf gets sick, you're, you're out your investment. Uh, so it is risky. It's, it's, not, it's not without risk like any other investment, right? <sighs> it's an interesting world we live in. Um, but yeah, if anyone's <laughs> investing in cows, let us know. <laughs> Please, dailytechnewsshow.com. China's Global Times reports that Huawei is testing a smartphone running its in-house Hongmeng OS. Sources tell the Global Times that the device will sell for 201, which is about 286 US dollars. Huawei previously described that want the Hongmeng OS as meant for Internet of Things, and the first major device to run it would be Huawei's Honor TVs, not smartphones. During its earnings announcement last week, Huawei chairman Ling Hua said that the company prefers to use Android on its mobile devices. So are they changing their tune? Yeah, I think you actually said 200 yuan. It's 2,000 if everybody's like, that That con conversion doesn't work. 2,000, yes. But yeah, yes about thank you. 300 bucks or less US is the point. Uh, interesting. This is almost a, a kind of a detective story, right? Because Huawei, like you said, has made all these noises about, no, this isn't for phones. We want to use Android. Uh, and then Global Times, which is a state-owned, uh, operation suddenly leaks that maybe they'll have that smartphone running, uh, Hongmeng OS by the end of the year, right when the trade war discussions are, are heating up again. Uh, it feels like maybe that is a well-placed leak. It, Huawei has not commented on this to Reuters, which is running this story. Mm. Uh, I haven't seen Huawei commenting on it anywhere else. So curious if this is 
if a real Huawei link or if this is just some politics being played? Yeah, I, d I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think any of us know no, it for the people at the Global Times, but uh, it, I, I, I would find it interesting if Huawei decided to call Bluff and put out a phone with the Hongmeng OS because that's risky if that mm -hmm. thing doesn't work up to snuff. So well, and okay. and and realistically, I mean, the company could have been testing an Internet of Things OS. Well, of course, um, you know, yeah, it's I been you know it's have, been yeah. talking about the fact that it's building an OS for 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 what a lot of us didn't know and kind of thought like this this thing has legs. Maybe you know let's test it in some mobile devices. So that you know it could have changed internally as well. I, I would I would characterize it more as they have an OS meant for Internet of Things. And when the trade war disputes started to happen, somebody said, "Well, we could put it on a phone, I guess." <laughs> and yeah, they're trying to figure that out. Right Why now. not? Yeah, timing's great. You thought we couldn't get through the show without a Facebook story, and you were right. Facebook confirmed it will rebrand Instagram and WhatsApp to Instagram from Facebook and WhatsApp from Facebook. The move follows similar rebrands for Workplace and Oculus. The new names will appear on Google Play and in the App Store for iOS, as well as the bottom of settings pages, but will keep the previous shorter names on installed app icons. According to a Facebook spokesperson, we want to be clear about the products and services that are part of Facebook. I got two theories on this. Uh, one is most people are not going to notice this because your icon is still going to say Instagram. When you go to the app store, you're not going to read Instagram from Facebook and, and freak out or anything. You're going to see the word Instagram if you're trying to install it and you're going to install it. But if they are fighting some kind of antitrust situation and they uh, one of their defenses is we haven't been trying to hide that these these are all part of one company. This could be the kind of maneuver you make to be like, we try to be very clear. In fact, recently, we just added Facebook to all these apps. So it was yeah. clear to people who they were getting the apps from, right? Yeah. My other thought is a little less solid ground, which is what if they want to improve the perception of Facebook by attaching the name to Instagram and WhatsApp, which are generously thought of, or, or generally thought of, I guess generously too, uh, more positively than Facebook itself. Well, and you, part of me is like, oh, come on, everybody knows that you know Instagram is owned by Facebook, but that's not true. In fact, we've talked about on, on recent episodes, um, many people polled have no idea what the parent company of some of their favorite apps are, whether it be Facebook branded apps or, or other companies. So there is definitely, by Facebook doing this, there there's going to be some overall understanding by the public that didn't really understand who owned what, that Facebook owns these products. I just don't, I just don't see, I don't know. Facebook is, Facebook has such an image issue these days, and it's not the only company that does, but it, but it, and it gets thrown in, under the bus, you know, as, as kind of the poster child for image issues, but, but it does. And to attach yourself to some of your really, really successful uh, brands, I just, it just looks, it looks bad to me. I mean, if this were an effective campaign, then yes, maybe my theory of they're trying to improve themselves by association, or maybe you're worried that this could actually cause damage to the brands of Instagram and WhatsApp would be valid, but they're not putting this up front and center. They're burying yeah. it on the settings page and they're putting it in the app store, which makes me go back to my original thought, which is this is some kind of legal defense or something they can point out later that they did it because it's not done in a way that's really most people are going to notice. I don't think. No. No. Computer scientists from MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, aka CSAIL, led by Alexander Casper, released two new papers describing software to create knitting patterns and designs to be used by a knitting machine. Inverse Knit uses a deep neural network trained on knitting patterns to create patterns from photos. You showed a photo. It creates a knitting pattern based on that photo. It's 94% accurate when being shown actual knitting, uh, but can only use acrylic yarn. It can only make designs with acrylic yarn. So they want to work on that to expand it to other kinds of yarn. The other one is called CAD knit, C-A-D-K-N-I-T, promising to let people with no previous experience customize templates to create knitting patterns. Casper imagines knitting as a service where consumers could use CAD knit to order customized garments. And then somebody who has a bunch of these knitting machines have them 
make the garments and send them out. It could also make the prototyping and manufacturing process for knitted items more efficient. And of course, existing knitters may want to hack the system to do a bunch of crazy new things that they couldn't if they didn't have these new tools. So I'll be interested to see what the knitting fans in the audience think about this and what they might use it for. But a revolution in knitting coming thanks to knitting machines like 3D printers for knitting uh, and some pretty cool look sound and software. You know, I, I am not a knitter. I know how to knit, but not well enough to make anybody anything. My grandmother was a great knitter. And what, what you know, she would say is, okay, I'm going to make you a new sweater, a new blanket or whatever. You know, it would be like a birthday present or something. And I would get a book and I would look through the knitting book and I would choose a pattern because there are only so many patterns that, you know, that that was the way that she knew how to knit what I wanted her to knit. Uh -huh. So it was, it was a finite kind of, you know, book of, 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 of knitting patterns patterns. The fact that I could be like, Ooh, cool. That lovely person on Instagram looks great in her sweater. I'm going to go ahead and take a photo of that and be able to replicate it with a knitting machine is awesome. But that also introduces some issues. Yeah. I think right now you can't copyright certain things in, in the, in the design world for clothing. Um, and, and so it doesn't have the same problem that 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 say patents right would have, yeah unless it was like a, a picture have. of somebody uh, but you're certainly not going to have any shortage of people getting up getting their nose bent out of shape out of it if they create an amazing pattern and then suddenly that pattern can be turned into a a, a script uh because of cad knit or or because of uh inverse knit uh the there will be that side of this too there's also the folks like your grandmother who would be able to say like, I've always wondered if I could make a design do this, but I never had the time to really work it out. So right. they've got this tool that they could be like, oh, boom, boom, boom. Cause I know what I'm doing and make something really cool. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm loving the idea that we will change knit one Pearl two to knit one Pearl script. <laughs> um, there's, yeah, there's, you know, there's the acrylic yarn. Eh, that's gonna, that, that, fine with me, but some people would be like, no, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, that, wear not, my sock that knitting. acrylic yarn, not me. But, uh, but yeah, in the way that 3d printing, I, there are certain uses for 3d printing where I'm like, Oh, that would be cool. If I had to, you know, 3d print a part for my broken washing machine or, you know, that sort of thing that always, uh, spoke to me a little bit more than the artistic nature of it. This is perfect. I mean, this is, you know, you, uh, especially in colder climates, uh, this is, this is clothing that could be, that could be made in mass. Yeah. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget you can subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Let's get back into it, uh, with some context on Cloudflare and 8chan. Cloudflare decided yesterday, uh, after originally thinking they wouldn't do this to stop providing its services to the message board 8chan as of midnight, Sunday night, Monday morning. That left 8chan open to denial of service attacks. If you don't know what Cloudflare is, it's a service that does a lot of things, but among its main uh, claim to fame is prevent sites from going down due to denial of service attacks. So uh, they withdrew that and 8chan went down. If you don't know what 8chan is, 8chan was created in 2013 by Frederick Brennan as an alternative to 4chan with less moderation. In 2015, Brennan gave up ownership and 8chan is now owned and run by Jim Watkins, a former U.S. Army veteran. Uh, Cloudflare previously terminated support for the Daily Stormer in 2017, which also moved to a different Cloudflare-like service, which is what 8chan did as well. We'll get into why 8chan is being banned by Cloudflare in a second if you don't already know. But uh, the Daily Stormer and 8chan, to, to you know, sum it up, are problematic because of some content posted there. Now, 8chan moved to BitMitigate. BitMitigate promises it will not stop service to any of its clients unless by final court order. However, infrastructure as a service provider Voxility, which rented the machines that BitMitigate used to provide its service, shut off its service to BitMitigate after, after BitMitigate brought 8chan back online. So 8chan went back down, as did the Daily Stormer and a few other sites that mitigate, BitMitigate provided services to. Now let's get into the rationalization of why Cloudflare would remove the service in the first place. 
Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince initially said Cloudflare would remain neutral, uh, sticking to only removing protections from sites as it is required to do so by law. Prince uh, removed protection for Daily Stormer uh, because after a lot of thinking about it and posted that he didn't want to do this again. He didn't think that Cloudflare should be in the position to decide what sites get to be on the internet or not. And it's not like Cloudflare is hosting the sites. Cloudflare is just protecting them from denial of service. But when that protection is removed, it essentially causes controversial sites in particular to go down until they find another way to protect themselves. In this case, it was going to be Bitmitigate, but now Bitmitigate lost its ability to host its service. CEO Matthew Prince cited postings by shooters in El Paso and previously Christchurch, New Zealand and Poway, California on 8chan as the reasons for doing this again. I'm gonna read a couple of quotes from his blog. We reluctantly tolerate content that we find reprehensible, but we draw the line at platforms that have demonstrated they directly inspire tragic events and are lawless by design. So he's calling 8chan lawless by design. He says, even if 8chan may not have violated the letter of the law in refusing to moderate their hate-filled community, they have created an environment that revels in violating its spirit. So he thinks 8chan is full of hate, and he thinks that it is violating the law in spirit. He did also say it does nothing to address why hateful sites fester online. It does nothing to address why mass shootings occur. It does nothing to address why portions of the population feel so disenchanted they turn to hate. In taking this action, we've solved our own problem, but we haven't solved the internets. And this is the interesting thing about Prince. Prince doesn't wade into this saying, well, we have to do this uh, because it's bad for PR if we don't, or because uh, we feel it is it is our job to do it. Prince wades into this saying, yeah, we've got a problem because we're hosting the site and we don't feel comfortable doing that because of what the site is. So we're he's very thoughtful in his explanation and says, we're going to remove that protection, but I want to make a point of saying this doesn't solve the problem. And I think he's, he, he's much better in a much better way saying what I've been saying about Facebook for a long time, which is you need to understand what the problem is to be able to fix it. And a lot of times I think maybe what I was missing was a lot of the problems we blame on Facebook don't start on Facebook. They start in other places on the internet. Uh, and this is one of those places where they oftentimes started. Now, granted, HN was able to move to Bitmitigate, although it does seem like Bitmitigate is now not going to be able to provide protection to HN. If that stays that way, the people who want to post to HN will go somewhere else. Uh, and and for example, a lot of folks who wanted to post uh, in support of, of other kinds of terrorism, uh, like ISIS, for example, uh, have started posting on Telegram, where they can't be found as easily and they can't be shut down as easily because Telegram says, we don't know what the conversations are because they're encrypted. So there is always going to be a place on the internet for these folks to go. Uh, I'm not saying that that doesn't mean Cloudflare isn't right to do this. I'm not saying that that doesn't mean there maybe shouldn't be some debate about what should be allowed uh, on, on unmoderated sites and what shouldn't. But I, I think it goes to Prince's point of there's a much more complex and deeper discussion to be to be had around why this is happening at all. Absolutely. Um, and to take the the content of of the sites in question out of out of out of the equation just for a second, something like Cloudflare saying, okay, this is this is not something that we're going to be associated with. And HN saying, okay, we'll go to Bitmitigate. They provide a similar service to you, and that's what we'll do. And and, and they have you know, they um they're going to accept something that you're not accepting. But then a company like Voxility shutting off its service to bit mitigate, you know, there's a supply chain thing going on here. Um, and then, you know, it, it, uh, um, bit mitigate itself, uh, Nicholas Slim selling bit mitigate to, you know, another owner who might have, um, or owners who, who might have their own feelings about this, this, you know, the, it, it's a little bit of a kind of a whack-a-mole situation of, okay, who are we dealing with? What does everybody think? Um, even if you go to a company that supposedly can keep things rolling, 
they often require another company to agree with that company. And that isn't always the case, especially when you get into very, very sensitive situations like the one that we're talking about now. Yeah. And I, I think where I, where I agree with Prince and a, a bunch of folks are saying in the chat room, just because there will always be a place doesn't mean one company has to provide that place. I don't think we want companies like Cloudflare or Voxility to have to be in the position to do this. Unfortunately, they are because there, there isn't any law that applies directly. And that's true of so many things on the internet. Our laws are not appropriate to the task because this is all so new, relatively speaking, compared to the long history of human experience. So I think Prince is bringing up a big point, which is saying, hey, it's not about what I do today at Cloudflare. Let's not leave it there. Let's come up with a solution that means Cloudflare doesn't have to play judge and jury. The Cloudflare can reasonably go back to saying, we just provide a service to anyone who legally can operate. Because what's happening now, we're seeing this a couple of times, particularly with Cloudflare, but also with Voxility, is companies saying, yeah, it would be legal, but I'm not sure I think it should be legal. In fact, that's exactly what Prince is saying. So let's have that conversation rather than, again, two years later, have Cloudflare have to go through the same thing again. I think, you know, and and again, I don't have all the answers, and this is such a sensitive topic in general, but right now, what you're describing would be Cloudflare turning a blind eye to content that it finds it objectionable should, but, to the point that it, it yeah. should not exist. Cloudflare should be able to provide a blind eye, right? Cloudflare should be. But, but I, that would that would change human behavior. I provide denial of service protection. I'm not expert in deciding what content should or shouldn't exist online. There should be another situation for that. I should they they shouldn't have to do that any more than the people who go and and string lines for your phone should be like, well, you you should pull the the line down to the company because right, you're right, a jerk, right? Yeah, like mm -hmm. like. I, do, I, I get that we're in that position where they have to, and therefore, as of today, you can rightly say, well, maybe you should, but couldn't we have the conversation that gets us to the point where they don't have to be in that position? That's what I'm saying. Well, we're having the conversation now, but what's the solution? Well, it it it's not easy, and that's that's the problem. And I think that's why Prince is, is sounds so exasperated in, in his blog post, which is it requires government and, and the populace and businesses to come up with something new to decide, okay, if someone creates a website online, what are the parameters that are allowed before the government can come in and shut it down? The reason ISIS got pushed into Telegram wasn't because Cloudflare went in and stopped them. It's because the Federal Bureau of Investigation and several other government agencies around the world went in and seized their websites and seized their equipment because there were very clear rules about terrorist operations and what you could do to them. There aren't clear rules about this kind of situation. Well, the story will be unfolding, and thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit because, unsurprisingly, it was a big story over the weekend in our subreddit because we're all of like minds. Uh, submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Jason wrote in from, he says, seasonable, hot, and humid Williamsport, Pennsylvania, home of the Little League Baseball World Series. Little League Baseball World Series. Tom, have you ever been there? No, I no. want to go someday, though. Sounds good. Yeah, I know. Let's let's uh, we'll do a road trip one of these days. Jason writes on Friday's show. The talk of Netflix blinking out of existence was discussed again. I don't think that'll happen anytime soon for quite a few reasons. Original content, international deals, etc. But one thing that's not talked about at all is comedy specials. When you see interviews done with stand-up comics, they always talk about the early years and what they had to do to get megastardom. Back in the 80s and 90s, it was getting a comedy special on HBO or Cinemax or Showtime. In the 2000s through about 2013 or 14, it was getting a comedy special on Comedy Central. From 2013 to 2014 to today, it's getting a comedy special on Netflix. The only place to find new and classic stand-up comedy specials is Netflix. Not necessarily true, but that is the that is the place where a lot of this is going. So if anyone is saving grace for Netflix for now, it would be comedy. Let's face it, anymore, we all just need to laugh. You'd be surprised how much better you feel afterwards. Keep up the excellent work. Uh, that's a great point, Jason. And uh, I'll be honest, uh, I, I don't think it's that nobody talks about this. I, I definitely see other, other outlets talking about it, but we didn't bring it up on Friday. You're right. And comedy is another one of those things that Netflix is doing to say like, you know, we know a chunk of the audience is going to come here for that. 
Uh, and so we're going to try to be the best at that. They're not trying to be the best at every single thing, but they are trying to be the best at a lot of different things to keep a lot of different kinds of people satisfied. So good insight. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. And thank you to our patrons. Yes. Thank you to everybody <laughs> who supports the show at patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, we are only able to have these kinds of discussions openly and without any thought to what a sponsor is going to say or what our owner is going to say, because you are our boss. You are the people we're accountable to. So please, uh, if you want to keep that going and you haven't already become a member, join us at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback for us, well, we're all ears. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is our email address. We are also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Not tomorrow with Shannon Morse. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>